Okay, everyone, uh, as folks are entering the Zoom room, uh, I want to welcome you all to the final uh, panel for the Expanding Empathy Speaker Series for the 2022 season. Um, we've had a, a great series of guests come through over the past several weeks. Um, so I really appreciated seeing many of you here for those. And uh, saving, uh, last but not least, uh, we have our final panel today on empathy and intergroup relations. Um, as a reminder, you know, one of the one of the themes for this year's series has been to really highlight the interdisciplinarity of what we do here at the Rock Ethics Institute of Penn State. And so we've had a philosopher and a psychologist in each of the four panels come and give talks, and then highlighting points of convergence, points of divergence between their perspectives. Um, yeah, so it's been a great series. And my co-organizer, Martina Arlandi, will introduce the speakers. And before she does, I just want to make sure to uh, thank again our sponsors, the Rock Ethics Institute, who uh, are the primary funder for the series, uh, but also the Social Science Research Institute, the Departments of Psychology and Philosophy, and the Edna Bennett Pierce Prevention Research Center, who are helping to uh, make this series uh, possible. So without further ado, Martina, you wanted to introduce uh, the speakers. Sure. So it is our pleasure to introduce our two speakers today, Emma McClure and Linda Tropp. So I just want to take a few seconds to tell you a bit more about them. So Emma McClure is an assistant professor of philosophy at St. Mary's University in Halifax. Her work is at the intersection of ethics, feminism, philosophy of law, and critical race theory. Her current research focuses on various topics within the ethics of conversation ranging from moral responsibility for microaggressions to supporting trauma recovery and self-reintegration. Uh, our second speaker, Linda Tropp, is a professor of social psychology and faculty associate in the School of Public Policy at UMass Amherst. She studies how members of different social groups experience contact with each other and how group differences in status affect cross-group relations. Her work focuses also on fostering positive relations between racial groups while achieving ever greater levels of racial equality and justice. So Dr. McClure is gonna start and give the first talk, which will last around 25, 30 minutes. Her talk is titled, Witnessing Microaggressions, Practicing Empathetic Resistance. Then we're gonna take a few minutes for Q&A, and then we're gonna to transition to our second talk from Dr. Tropp, who's going to be talking about empathy and indifference in predicting race and immigration policy attitudes. Emma, I think you have shared your handout with us already. Yeah, I'll chat, put it in right? the chat again so everyone should be able to see it now. Okay. All right, take it away. All right, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so you're welcome to follow along on the handout. I'm hoping it won't be uh, completely necessary, but if you'd like to, please take a look. Okay. So, I did want to start out just with a content note because I will be mostly focusing on microaggressions. Uh, but as you can see just right there at the top of the handout, one thing that I think microaggressions, what that's interesting about them is how they fit with other forms of violence. So I'll be mentioning uh, some more macro levels of aggression like uh, rape. So if that's uh, something you need to step away from for a moment, please feel very, very free to like move in and out of the webinar. Okay, glad to jump in. I, so yeah, so this talk is building within a framework that I developed in my paper in 2020, thinking of microaggressions as part of a spectrum of escalating violence. So all of these different pieces work together to create the kind of structural uh, racism or sexism or other forms of oppression that we have. Uh, and they each work slightly differently, but sort of towards the same end of creating these hierarchies um, and forms of oppression. So I'll be mostly focusing on microaggressions, which I think work by, function by, propagating and reinforcing stereotypes about the target's place where they naturally belong. Uh, but that also connects in interesting ways to more macro forms like hate speech, which uh, more explicitly advocates for the same sort of thing. And even thinking about hate crimes or forms of state-sponsored violence, uh, perhaps most recently, although I didn't put it on the handouts, things like uh, outlawing abortion as part of the same process. But as I said, I'll be focusing mostly on the microaggressions because uh, I think this is still something we need to think more about. Um, and especially, this is, I think, one of the first times that people are explicitly connecting empathy and the empathy of bystanders of microaggressions and what effects we might see there 
But just to catch you up in case um, you haven't thought much about microaggressions, either from a personal perspective or through research, I'll just start with these few examples. And these are drawn from Gerald Wing Sue's book, Microaggressions in Everyday Life. Just to give a working definition, uh, microaggressions are these small stereotypical slights that when repeated can accumulate into serious damage to members of marginalized groups. So the first time someone says something like this, like you're not like other girls, it might be easy to take that as a kind of compliment, um, especially if you're kind of young. <laughs> I, oh great, they don't see me um, as needy, they don't see me as dramatic, they think I'm special. Uh, but then over time, slowly, you start to hear the subtext of, wait, what's wrong with being like other girls? Why shouldn't I want to be like other girls? What do you think of other girls? What happens if I am like other girls later on? And you hear this kind of uh, implicit threat maybe in it of uh, all is not right with this relationship. And these can happen in various different forms. So that's one sort of second personally. Uh, the second one also is similar where somebody might say, especially after they've been accused of committing a microaggression, it's really, really common to sort of blame the victim and say something like, calm down, you're overreacting. Like, how dare you? I'm not a racist, I'm not a sexist. I, but again, this is itself a microaggression. Um, it's based on this stereotype or informed by the stereotype of women, especially women of color, or other multiple marginalized groups. Uh, being hysterical, being uh, oversensitive, being paranoid. And that's why it's so easy to say things like this and have them really resonate is there's a stereotype already that uh, a woman's being too dramatic when she tries to call this out. And then finally, uh, another way this might work is more of a, an overheard microaggression. I call these the ambient microaggressions where when somebody says something like, this was very common um, in my high school when I was growing up, that's so gay. Uh, it's not, they're maybe saying this to a gay person. They're saying this about something ostensibly unrelated, like a boring party or like uh, a rule from a parent. But then it just implicitly assumes everyone knows in order to understand the sentence that there's something wrong with being gay. Like it's an insult and you don't have to say why it's an insult, it's just already there in the culture, the stereotype that gay people are weird and um, unnatural in some way. And so, yeah, so they come in these various different forms that I won't get into too much in this talk, but I'm very happy to go through in q and if you're interested. I, but I wanna sort of change the way that we usually focus on them. Usually uh, people like Sue and various other microaggression scholars, I think rightfully focus on the effects on targets um, that what happens over time, maybe corrosions of agency, or uh, even like when it very first happens, you might just feel stressed of like taking the time to try to interpret what even happened. Can I say anything? Will that affect the relationship? There's a lot of time and energy invested in reacting to microaggressions or deciding not to react to microaggressions, both comes with costs. And that's sort of constant pervasive stress of being just exposed to these stereotypes over and over again just in all facets of your life, it's been shown can really add up to very serious damage, damages to health, um, even damages to relationships, damages to uh, hopefulness, or just the ability to imagine possible futures. So the kind of effect on targets, still lots more to do there, but it has been talked about a fair bit already. But what I haven't seen as much of is the effect on bystanders, so witnesses to microaggressions. And that's what I'm interested in today. And particularly given the um, theme of the series, the effect on bystanders' uh, empathetic capacities, their ability to empathize with the target of the microaggressions rather than with the perpetrator. And I think like there are other sort of things you could witness that would affect your empathy. But I think it's really interesting to think about microaggressions because it can be so hard to notice that they're happening. Like I've given some sort of more common examples, but especially for something like the last one, so that's so gay. Hopefully everyone now knows not to say that. Um, we've talked about it enough, but I think we still all, or it's much more common to still say something like, that's crazy or that's insane um, or that's lame. Uh, that I think we still have the same type of 
wording and the same type of default assumption about what's good or bad uh, about other groups that we haven't talked as much about or just different forms of these microaggressions. So I think even if we've learned to see some of them, we could, are still really shaped by other things that we just witness all the time that they're so pervasive that we don't even challenge them or think about them as something that might need to be challenged. Okay, so I'm going to suggest that one thing all of these microaggressions have in common and even others you might think of is that they prioritize a certain perspective. And that's part of what unifies all these different stereotypes is that the perspective about who's worth listening to versus who is erased or disbelieved or not centered. So going through them in the order I have them, when someone says something and like somebody witnesses somebody else saying something like you're not like other girls, there is, you know, given how common other forms of that stereotype are, there's just a sense that the speaker, maybe somebody's boyfriend saying you're not like other girls, he's the judge of things, he's to be trusted, he can, um, has a better perspective on it, that there's the centering of this men as like good judgment, reasonable, uh, likely to be believed when they do this sort of thing, whereas girls are, as I've been discussing, dramatic or um, something you don't want to be like. And I think similar sorts of things happen with the other, that when someone's told to calm down, you're overreacting, it's our default move is to sympathize with or empathize with the perpetrator um, of, because we we all know the stereotype and it's, and it, hopefully we've done work to try to resist it, to try to get outside of it. But I, so like I've been, was raised certainly steeped in these um, growing up in the Midwest. And it's still like my immediate reaction is to be like, oh, like, is that person overreacting? And then no, you got to step back from that. I, and so that there's a centering of the perspective that the white man is, again, reasonable, his anger is righteous. And I'll be going through more examples of these in a minute. I, whereas the person reacting to the microaggression is assumed to be by default overreacting, oversensitive, not bringing up something that's true. And that's sort of what makes these microaggressions make sense is that we have these interpretive biases, um, some of which are empathetic biases. And then finally, for something like that's so gay, this, again, I have more to say about this, but I'll try to be brief. This one, um, sort of erases gay people in the room. Like it's sort of assumed by default that there's no one listening who would be offended by this. So again, in my high school, no one was out, probably because people said things like this all the time, but it was assumed uh, everyone knew that none of our friends were gay, none of us were gay. Uh, and so it was okay to say things like this because there weren't any gay people listening. And so the perspective was all us straights, uh, whatever we turned out to actually be, are just talking and we're not being homophobic because there's not any gay people in the room. So yeah, so my suggestion with all of these is that there is kind of buried within them in order to even make sense of what they're saying, this default of empathizing with a certain perspective, with the privileged perspective of certain groups are within this hierarchy, more believable, more worth paying attention to, more worth censoring and more worth caring about their feelings. I'm going to now split into two pieces. So I'm going to talk about outgroup bystanders and then in-group bystanders at the end of the talk. I, and I'm going to, yeah, so as I said, like microaggression research hasn't focused as much on this, but I'll be using pieces of that research and of other research, not necessarily even about bystanders, but about uh, maybe perpetrators um, and then the targets for the in-group bystanders. Okay, but I'll get to that. So what's the effect on an outgroup bystander? So somebody who's not uh, a woman listening to someone say, you're not like other girls, uh, somebody who's not a woman of color for the calm down, you're overreacting, somebody who's not gay listening to that's okay. I, so I'm going to suggest that the effect on these kind of outgroup bystanders where they're sort of hearing over and over again, this kind of stereotype about a group that they're not a member of uh, is a corrosion of their empathy. Um, it's not necessarily going to happen, um, and it's not that there's nothing they can do about it, nothing we can do about it, but rather that there's just this risk of uh, empathy 
being made more difficult, maybe ultimately being lost. And the empathy for the marginalized people, whereas the empathy for the privileged people is sort of over uh, emphasized and over learned and learned too well, and we do it too automatically. Okay. And so empathy often is separated into these more cognitive and these more effective parts and following that here. For the kind of cognitive harm to outgroup bystanders, we can draw from other research by Charles Mills on white ignorance. Uh, so thinking about how white people as a whole tend not to want to see racism. We don't want to admit that it's happening. It's to our benefit in many ways to not admit structural features and the ways that we've been privileged by them. Uh, and to just say like, oh, I don't see color and um, that kind of conversation. But Mills points out that while in some ways this is motivated, like it's really beneficial for white people to not admit what's going on and to try to maintain our innocence in this kind of way. He also points out how this is still in other senses a harm that we're not seeing the world as it really is. We're not, uh, we're sort of, there's barriers both from within ourselves and from outside of ourselves to understanding what's actually going on and to forming true beliefs about the world. And so that's a cognitive kind of harm. And interestingly, uh, Chester Pierce in 1970, he's the one who coined the term microaggressions. And he was kind of the last person to really talk about this effect on bystanders and as well as first, where he calls white children who see microaggressions happening as these bigots in training, it's a hugely evocative phrase, uh, that they're learning to be like this um, and that they're uh, sort of practicing and seeing adults modeling what it looks like to do this kind of aggressive act of centering white perspectives and ignoring or disbelieving or erasing black perspectives in terms of Pierce's work. So, so yeah, so my argument here is just that this is a harm, this is a loss, um, even though it does bring certain advantages to bystanders to center themselves if they're white in this ways, it's also um, an inability to understand the truth of the world. And then there's, I think, also this effective component that uh, Kate Mann brings out really well in her book, Down Girl, in 2017, where she coins the term empathy. And here's where I get a little bit into talking about rape. So she talks about like the Brock Turner pot trial. We might talk instead about the Brett Kavanaugh. Um, uh, sorry, the word just flew out of my head where he was uh, put onto the Supreme Court. Those hearings, um, both men, uh, accused of sexual assault, accused of rape. And what Mann says is really disturbing about the way that our culture looks at these men is that we're just by default inclined to sympathize with the perpetrators of these crimes. And that's like, and you can really see that coming out in something like the Brock Turner trial, where if you remember, he was given a sentence of six months in jail of which he only served three for assaulting a girl, she was unconscious. It was very clear what was happened. There was no question about what had happened, but the judge, as well as many people in the media, as well as many people in the world, were so focused on what about Brock Turner's future? He has this bright future, he has a swimming career. Like we're supposed to really, really care about him and not care at all about the person he did this to. I, and like, again, I, we see these same resonances with uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, experience. So Kate Mann identifies this sort of affective harm of empathy of we have this default, this um, tendency, this habit of empathizing with perpetrators with that same perspective I've been talking about this whole time of those privileged people, rather than empathizing with the marginalized, the people. Um, and in this case, it's a very extreme example. But I think the same sort of thing happens with microaggressions, that this is where we learn how to do that. This is where we learn who to pay attention to, whose emotions to care about. So I bring up the, the Brett Kavanaugh uh, sentencing because, not sentencing, sorry, the hearings, that's the word, because he cried during them. And everyone, like so much of the media was like, oh, he was crying. Look how emotional this man is. Look how much he must be feeling to have it falsely accused. And, I, and that same empathy was not given to by the same people to the person who was accusing him. So that's an instance of empathy. And I think a similar sort of thing happens and it's sort of we're trained into it in this bigots and training kind of way uh, to do it for people through microaggressions, through witnessing this is just a default. This is just how we do things, how we think 
And so I think it's important to talk about those problems specifically for microaggression. And also because if we can identify the problem, then you can start looking at these interventions as people have started to do, even though they haven't paid a lot of attention to bystanders. Somebody like Regina Rini in her recent book talks a little bit about it, that we can retrain our habits of empathy with where if we default empathizing with privileged people, we can practice empathizing with other groups. And I think Linda will probably talk about this later on uh, as well, where we can practice perspective taking, sort of imagining the viewpoint and emotional reactions that someone else would have who we're not used to empathizing with, but could learn how to do. Uh, and that might also involve things like learning the history of stereotypes, even something like following people on Instagram to get different perspectives, different, uh, emotional reactions from people or certainly making friends in real life that you can do these different interventions once we know that the problem is that we've learned to empathize with perpetrators instead of with targets. Okay, so yeah, still a few minutes. So I wanna end the talk by thinking now, not about our group bystanders, not about white people watching this being done to a person of color, but about especially about in-group bystanders. So people, uh, so like women watching it being done to other women um, or other groups watching it being done to their own group. And I think we see a similar sort of breakdown uh, and I'll be drawing a little bit from Soba Fatima's work, but she was mostly talking again about that effect on the target rather than that effect on the bystander witnessing this. But we can see the same kind of breakdown between cognitive harm and effective harm. Only here, it's not about a barrier to understanding the world, or it's not just about that. It's also a barrier to self-knowledge. I wanna suggest that it's not being able to, if you can't understand what's happening to another member of your group, then there's gonna be times when you can't understand what's happening to yourself. Uh, and I actually think this is not just microaggressions, but might even be for more macro harms, like understanding yourself as having been assaulted. Uh, because if you're just so default into that habit of denying that there's anything there to empathize with and just taking the perpetrator as this person who we should always be focused on and think about his feelings and think about what he's doing, then it makes it very, very difficult to tell any different story, even when it happens to you. And then I also wanna be thinking about the effective parts of that, our emotional reactions. Because in the same way that I think there's barriers to self-knowledge of understanding what is happening to the other person in this moment and also what's happening to you in other moments if you've been the target of a microaggression or some more macro harm. I, there's also this difficulty with emotional access of if we can't take the perspective of somebody in our own group, if we can't imagine what those emotions are, if we've learned to sort of almost like dial down the volume on that and dial it up on um, the perpetrators and the white men of the world. Then again, what happens when we're reacting to a microaggression that's been committed against us? Maybe what happens is that we can't feel our own feelings to use that sort of Instagram language, that we have this diminished emotional access uh, and we can't uh, understand what we're feeling very well. And again, I wanna focus on these problems and really dive into them uh, because I think there's possibilities for intervention. Maybe again, we can counter that habit of empathy with privileged people, even with the people doing this to us by practicing what we might call self-empathy. Uh, and if you have any advice on where to look for this in q and I'm really, really interested in that because I'm only just starting to find it. It's sort of in a little bit of philosophy with the Sherman, uh, mostly in psychology, I think with uh, new brand, even like psychoanalysis sort of work. But my idea here is that self-empathy, we might be able to do that practicing, retraining our habits. And even if the ultimate goal is to sort of feel our own feelings, the way to do that uh, might be, or a helpful way to do that might be imagining being able to empathize with someone else who's experiencing that. And that, that might actually be a better route to sort of self-knowledge and self-understanding than trying to sort of take all the complex emotions that you've been repressing for so long and figure out what those are doing. It might be easier to imagine how a friend who shares your identity, somebody you're witnessing in these situations that I've been imagining would feel and try to empathize with them as an ultimate route to be able to empathize with yourself. Uh, so I've been 
trying to do this in my own life, but sample size one, I'm a philosopher. <laughs> uh, so yeah, especially any psychologists if you have advice for me here, that would be really wonderful. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Emma. That was absolutely great. A um, lot to think about, a lot of really great insights. So we have a few minutes uh, for questions, uh, but Linda, if you have a question for Emma, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, uh, to all the people that are attending, you can uh, type your question in the chat or in the Q&A box. I, I just have some suggested readings and I'd love to save more time for audience questions. So I'll just send a couple of references to, to Emma and we can chat more later. Thank you. Okay. And for anybody who um, joined us after the start, uh, if you're interested, um, Dr. McClure dropped the, 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 Dropbox, the Dropbox link at the top um, is the link to the presentation. So just up there. So I suppose one question, um, um, oh yeah, self-compassion definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Linda's mentioning self-compassion is, uh, there's certainly a lot of great work in that literature on understanding um, how self-compassion might promote compassion towards others more generally. Um, I think on that note, one question I had, listening to your talk, um, you know, one point of debate within the empathy but scholarship is about the different parts of empathy, the different pieces of empathy, um, whether it's feeling what others are feeling or engaging in perspective taking or generating feelings of compassion and concern for others. For some of these arguments you're presenting, um, I mean, do you see particular pieces of empathy as having more relevance over others or are they sort of interwoven? In your view? Uh, I do see them as interwoven, I, but maybe, like particularly the affective portions, I think might be quite useful. Uh, especially since like our sort of, what I'm most concerned with is the kind of default reaction, maybe that even before we can really get in and be like, rethink it and go through it cognitively and be like, oh no, that's not the reaction I wanna have. Uh, but if, if it seems like, um, and I, yeah, I don't know how well this matches with other work in empathy, that it like emotion might provide this like shortcut to actually get there faster and to get more of, a, of the kind of reaction we wanna have. So there's a question here from Maria. What do you suggest a community can do to affect change and become a more empathetic society? Great right. question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, th I think one thing is thinking especially about media. And again, Regina Rini does some work on this, I, of thinking about, and actually even Chester Pierce started out, uh, the guy who coined the term microaggression. He actually worked in television. He worked on Sesame Street. Uh, and it, like he created Sesame Street partially as oh, a way wow. to re-educate um, racial norms and being showing people like, oh, black kids and white kids can get along and like these black teachers can be really respected. Uh, and it worked, um, it worked well, like it didn't solve racism obviously, but it did, I think improve things. Um, and so I think we should think more as a community about uh, what we're consuming, uh, what kind of media we're consuming, what, and especially what we're producing, what we're putting money towards and like rewarding, uh, you know, Oscar's so white sort of uh, resistance. Um, and so yeah, becoming a more empathetic society, like so often people are like, don't watch television, but I think actually television could be really valuable and so did Pierce. We just have to be watching the right stuff. Linda, you have a question? Go ahead. You know, I actually had kind of a comment in relation to what Emma just shared, because I'm also thinking about some research in psychology that shows that encouraging children to think critically about what they view on television, even if it contains messages that we don't agree with, can also be a way to promote greater insight. So instead of just automatically processing those images that might fuel the development of stereotypes or lead to future engagement in microaggressive behavior, <laughs> to get students to kind of stop that default and, and more like raise to consciousness those 
kind of more unconscious processes involved in taking in information. That might be another way to, to think about changing the associations that student, that kids have and also what they think would be normative or acceptable. Yeah, and I, I really like that because then I see Maria's followed up with what would a regular citizen be able to do if you're not a Hollywood executive? Okay, fair enough. Uh, and, and yeah, what Linda just said that it seems like parents especially might have some influence or anyone who's working with children, um, any educator might be able to do something like this. Uh, and, um, and actually Gina goes through sort of how to retrain yourself. And it seems like starting with your own case as a good first step. Um, and then yeah, be talking to your friends about how to be critical, like Linda's saying, um, or how to, uh, you know, places that provide these different perspectives that we might otherwise get. Uh, so yeah, just having conversations about it and trying to especially reach children, but adults too. Um, and yeah, thinking about where you might go and when, whether it's television or again, I'm, I'm really high on Instagram right now. <laughs> I'm thinking about how, like who you're following or who your friends are following, or could you, yeah, to sort of change the inputs into that are happening in your life. Um, and then hopefully that would then change your life. <laughs> Found what you said about um, employing empathy for others as a way to spark self-empathy really interesting as a way to sort of like imagine seeing yourself from a, an outsider perspective. I mean, maybe there's a metaphor here that could be of help about the way we feel when we have imposter syndrome. Uh, if we saw ourselves as another person, we would have no problem in acknowledging all the successes, all like how qualified that person is in doing, having the job that they have. But for some reason, when it comes to us, it's impossible to do that. And that's what part of what imposter syndrome is about. So, I mean, one thing that I've done for myself, and again, like a sample of like one philosopher is uh, try to think of myself as what if, what, what would I think if I was another person? If I, if, and it turns out if, if the answer is, I would have no doubt, then I should apply that answer to myself. So that's a way in which imagining seeing myself from, from the eyes of an outsider actually improves the way I think about myself and, and my self-esteem. Yeah, I like that. Uh, and particularly because Linda's brought up self-compassion in the chat. Um, it seems like, yeah, like trying, trying to change the way that you, like how sympathetic you are to yourself and um, how harsh you are about judging your particular uh, background. It could really help to bring in those ideas. Yeah, yeah, and especially I think with like some of the biases that we have like about women um, and many other groups that were supposed to be self-effacing or self-sacrificing uh, and then to be able to like resist that. You're not supposed to do it for yourself, but maybe we can do it for other women. Um, and if we start doing it for other women, then we can develop these like virtuous cycles of rebounding back on ourselves. Yeah. Okay, well, let's just wait a bit more if there are other questions. One thing that's interesting about uh, your presentation, when you, see, when you mentioned that microaggressions can harm bystanders' empathetic capacities, I mean, I think it is interesting to consider, that depending upon your stance on empathy and you know the inhibitors that people might have for deploying it in different contexts, if there's intergroup hostilities of various kinds, um, you know, like in a, in a political polarization context, this has become quite evident recently. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting, like how if microaggressions can harm empathetic capacities, it seems you seem to suggest in ways that are even more subtle and insidious than like witnessing the macroaggressions. It's suggesting that it's by, by changing people's basic abilities to empathize in ways they may not fully themselves recognize to the degree that they witness this and are sort of shaped and their, their empathetic attentions and efforts are being subtly pushed in different directions. It does connect to a lot of the empathy literature in a really interesting way, I think, because it suggests that, you know, a lot of the motivational work focuses on these very clear cut sorts of inhibitors and rewards that we talk about, but I think a little bit less on the subtle ways in which how we even make sense of the costs and benefits are shaped by some of these moves that are being made in society. So yeah, that, 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 that's just, it's not really a question, but it just, it's an interesting way that I think 
adds cool insight to some of the work in psychology being done on empathy. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, it would, oh, sorry, it would just be hard to know, like, like, because since micro, like, one of the problems with microaggressions are, yeah, that they sort of build up slowly over time. So like, it'd be hard to know how to study the, those effects on empathy. Like, it might be, like, it's, it's easier if you can do a bigger um, piece of it than these sort of, some people talk about it, like, little raindrops sometimes. It takes a long time to get fully saturated. And, and you'd always, like, whenever you would pick out people to be in studies, they'd already have been shaped by this since childhood, since birth. <laughs> there are a couple more questions I see. Um, Maria in the, over on the side is asking about a regular citizen's first step towards addressing some of these empathetic changes but also wants to know if you'll share the authors and titles you mentioned. Yeah, I think they're mostly on the handout, which I'll share again. Um, they're on the second page. But I will go looking for the, there's a lovely article of Pierce's work on Sesame Street that I will try to find um, in a little bit. And there is one more question and then perhaps we could uh, then transition over to Linda's talk. Um, Natalie, says, thank you for this talk, uh, has a question about the suggestion that not being able to empathize with the victim of a microaggression may translate into an inability to understand what has happened to you, the witness, member of the same marginalized group um, as the victim in this case, uh, when you're the victim of a microaggression. Um, Dr. McClure shared a paper on microaggressions of me by Saba Fatima, in which Fatima argues that the collective knowledge of those who are microaggressed functions as a resource for those who are the victims of microaggression. Tapping into this collective knowledge can help them get clear on what has happened to them, can validate them when others attempt to suggest that nothing has, no, no microaggressions have occurred. So you're wondering, uh, uh, Natalie's wondering how Fatima's emphasis on the existence of this kind of collective knowledge plugs into Dr. McClure's own suggestions. Yeah, um, I'll share that paper too. I, how does this work? So, so yeah, I think that, I hadn't thought about it this way before, but the the idea of, because so much of the epistemic injustice literature is about how, like, whose community are we paying attention to, essentially, that in, in certain spaces, in white spaces, you don't hear much from the perspective of people of color, but then their whole time, uh, people of color have been talking to each other and developing their own uh, resources for talking about these things. And I, yeah, so to so think about this from this more community perspective, I like that uh, idea that it, it's not something like the individual has to do by herself of just thinking like within my own mind, how could I take these different perspectives, but to think of it as, and maybe this is even where Maria was going with some of the questioning of how do we collectively retrain our empathy and those two processes, yeah, I like how Natalie links those together. Um, and that, yeah, we don't have to all reinvent the wheel. It's that we have to go look at how people who have more empathy for themselves and have more understanding of their own feelings and have done the hard work of removing those layers of oppression that keep you from yourself. Uh, maybe even, I wonder if we could do things like reading those narratives um, from other people about yeah, getting or like a memoir almost of how getting from a place where you can't hear yourself to a place where you can, and what it what that feels like or what that process how it began. Yeah, I like the suggestion. I'll follow up on that. Thank you. Great. Well, in that case, why don't we then uh, turn it over to Dr. Linda Tropp, uh, who will talk about her research. Thank you so much um, uh, for the invitation. And I love this format of, of having philosophers and psychologists uh, learn more about each other's work and see possible points of connection. Um, so admittedly, I'm, I'm on the psychology side. I can even tell you, I've always been interested in social and political philosophy. I took um, 
a philosophy class, social and political philosophy class, my senior year of college as an elective. And the, the basic feedback that I got <laughs> from my professor was, you know, just I love your ideas and your commitment to social justice issues, but as a philosopher, you need a lot of work. And I think that was because um, as an undergrad, and I think I've continued this way, I, um, I kind of just got frustrated asking the questions. I'm such an empiricist. I wanted to collect data. Um, so I hope that you'll see some of the themes kind of carrying over from what Emma talked about into what I'll be talking about today. I also just first wanted to be sure to acknowledge my collaborators on this research. Um, the top row includes social psychologists, uh, one of my graduate students, Tricia Derone, Eric Knowles at New York University and at the University of Sussex, and uh, a couple of sociologists, Dina Okamoto and Helen Merrow, and then Michael Jones Correa, a, a political scientist. So where we really started off in this program of research was you know, reflecting on the role of empathy and intergroup relations in the psychology, psychology literature um, in terms of the focus of empathy that we're talking about here, we're really talking about empathic concern, um, how we might feel concerned for and about the experiences that other groups are having. And research in this area has shown that the more um, we express empathic concern in relation to what other groups are experiencing, the more inclined we are to help others in need, to express more positive attitudes toward disadvantaged groups as members of an advantaged group, and also uh, being more willing to support government policies that would support the interests of disadvantaged groups. And then as we continue to think about this role of empathy and how deeply uh, rooted our focus has been on empathy, we started to wonder whether that's really the only issue that we need to, to think about. And we were reflecting on some you know, cultural messages. <laughs> this might be familiar to a number of people in the audience. When uh, Melania Trump going to the border with Mexico wore this coat saying, I really don't care with you. And we were kind of struck by this thinking like, is this really just an example of low empathy or is there something else going on here that we don't spend as much time thinking about in the psychology research literature? Um, and this was also has been expressed in many different other public contexts, including um, an op-ed by Aaron Aubrey Kaplan talking about how, you know, oftentimes when it comes to discussions of racial justice or segregation, uh, members of disenfranchised or disadvantaged groups feel ignored or dismissed, uh, getting the sense that those more powerful groups are indifferent to their plight or to their lived experience. So we wanted to think about this issue of indifference um, that has been explored a bit in the sociology research literature as a lack of concern for the welfare of others or apathy regarding the existence of societal inequality. And there is some evidence in sociology to suggest that indifference regarding the mistreatment of racial and ethnic minority groups is, among, is on the rise among white Americans. Um, and so we were trying to think about whether, you know, indifference is really just the flip side of empathy? Are they basically representing the same thing or might they be representing very related but somewhat distinct concepts? And so, you know, this is still a work in development. We're still trying to wrap our heads around it, but um, we were thinking that perhaps indifference is really an issue of like, is this group or community of people, even within the realm of moral concern, do they get included in our circles of moral concern? Um, and then empathy is more of a question of if they're on our radar or in our circles at all, in terms of moral concern, how high or low does that moral concern go? Um, so that's just one way that we've been trying to think about it. And so part of the research that I'll be talking about today that has led us to think about empathy and indifference in these ways, is our work looking at both empathy and indifference simultaneously as predictors for group-based policy attitudes, um, for uh, group-related issues like race-targeted policies or immigration policies. So the basic questions underlying what I'll be talking about are, does this indifference idea really uniquely predict policy attitudes beyond what can be accounted for by measures of empathy and in particular empathic concern? And do empathy and indifference uniquely predict policy attitudes beyond what can be predicted by other well-established predictors of policy attitudes that pertain to group membership, things like threat or attitudes or things like that in relation to other groups? So I'll be summarizing 
as swiftly as I can results from three studies. Uh, to start off with our, our first study, which was just an online survey of white Americans on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, we had a broad range of respondents in terms of their age, pretty split evenly in terms of their gender identification, also varied across the political spectrum. And uh, most of our, or nearly half of our respondents had at least a four-year college degree. Um, many also reported having a more advanced degree, but we also had considerable numbers of respondents who re reported lower education levels. So again, a broad range across the education level spectrum as well. We developed measures of empathy and indifference based on our reading of the research literatures on these topics, just to give you a sense of what were included among these items on, you know, in terms of em empathy or empathic concern, we focused on, the, you know, caring about the experiences of black people in the US or feeling concerned that black people are treated unfairly. Whereas indifference, you can see in many ways in this wording is, is kind of the flip side. It, you know, it's not really my problem if black people experience unfair treatment or I'm not particularly concerned about the experiences of black people in the US. I will tell you, you know, starting off, we really thought these were kind of flip sides of the same coin and we wanted to see, would they just overlap in what they assess or do they seem to represent somewhat distinct dimensions? So as a next step, we entered all of these items into a, an exploratory factor analysis, a principal components analysis that yielded two separate factors, which pretty clearly showed that you know, one of those factors included the indifference items and one of those factors included the empathy items. So they seem to be related, but representing somewhat distinct concepts. And you can see they're inversely correlated, but not perfectly correlated. Um, we also uh, then did confirmatory factor analysis where we compared a two-factor model with empathy and indifference as separate factors compared to a one-factor solution. And overall, we found that uh, the two-factor model, having empathy as one factor and indifference as another factor, fit the data better compared to a one-factor model that included all of them in the same factor. So then we were interested in using these measures of empathy and indifference as predictors for respondents' race-targeted policy support. So we included a few items in the survey uh, where we, you know, we told our respondents that we were interested in their views on a number of political issues and embedded in a longer list of policy issues were three that really focused on racially tinged policy issues, greater enforcement of laws to ensure fair treatment of black people, greater efforts to implement affirmative action programs in employment and education, and stronger enforcement of laws to protect voter access in racial minority communities. Uh, those loaded together, um, to represent like a single concept. So we um, have this three item indicator for race target, targeted policy support. And we also included a variety of other kind of group relevant measures as predictors for this race policy support, including people's external motivation to control prejudice, to take into account how concerned they might be about appearing prejudiced in the eyes of others, a feeling thermometer, which is basically like an attitude measure. What are their racial attitudes in relation to black people? And also their prior contact experiences. Um, you know, how positive or friendly has their prior experience with black people been since, you know, a lot of the research literature has suggested that the more contact people have with other groups, the more they tend to have positive attitudes and the more they tend to empathize with those other groups and their concerns. So all of these measures are basically from the perspective of white people are white respondents in relation to black people. And then what we did was we entered those kind of three group-based indicators that have been associated with racial attitudes and empathy in prior research, along with the like personal or characteristics of our respondents um, including age, their gender, level of education, socioeconomic status, and their political ideology being kind of liberal or conservative leaning. At the first step of this regression analysis, we entered all of them as possible predictors for race policy support. And then after those were taken into account, we included our measures of empathy and indifference at a second step of the analysis to see if either or both of these indicators would contribute to predicting race policy support beyond what could already be predicted at the first step of the analysis. What we find is that among our white respondents, 
uh, political ideology is associated with like a more conservative ideology is associated with less race policy support, not surprising based on my read of prior literature. Um, the more quality contact they have with black people is more positively associated with race policy support, also consistent with what we've observed in prior research. And then at the second step of analysis, when we enter empathy and indifference, we see that they are both uniquely predicting different portions of variance in race policy support, as we would expect. Greater empathy being associated with more policy support for race-related re issues, whereas indifference is associated with less policy support for race-related issues. So in our next study, I mean, we were kind of struck by this. We're like, really? We kind of expected they'd account for the same variance, not different portions of variance. So we wanted to see if we could replicate these basic findings. And we were fortunate to be able to include just a couple of items uh, that would represent empathy and indifference in a nationally representative sample of white Americans in the US. And here we were also fortunate in that we were able to include some additional measures of group-based concepts that have been uh, shown to be um, inversely related to support for race-based policies, especially intergroup threat, perceiving greater threat in relation to racial and ethnic minority outgroups and social dominance orientation, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, uh, but this idea that it's appropriate to have social hierarchies such that some groups are better or have more access to resources than others. So this is a sample of 2,600 white Americans, again, a nationally representative sample, where we included indicators of empathy and indifference, as well as measures of support for policies benefiting racial and ethnic minorities as compared to only being focused on Black Americans in the first study. And here we had um, measures of uh, racial attitudes, feeling thermometers, similar to the prior study, but now including feeling thermometers in relation to Blacks, Latinos, and Asians, and also how much contact our white respondents had with each of these groups uh, to create composite measures of those concepts, while also including measures of perceived economic and political threat from these groups, and a more general measure of support for social dominance or support for social hierarchies. Um, as compared to having our multi-item measures in the first study, we only had space to include single item indicators of empathy and indifference in this study, uh, but know that these items loaded highly on the factors, like they were kind of central items from the, first, um, from the factors that we observed in the first study to represent empathy and indifference. Um, and here we only had space to include two items focused on pol policy support, the laws to ensure fair treatment of racial and ethnic minorities and greater support for efforts to implement affirmative action programs. The correlation between these items was a bit weaker than in the first study, so we analyzed them separately and looked at a variety of measures as predictors for each of them. So in the case of fair treatment, having laws to promote fair treatment of racial and ethnic minorities, uh, once again, we see political ideology uniquely predicting uh, less policy support. We also see social dominance coming through as a predictor, um, all at the first step of the analysis. But then at the second step of the analysis, beyond uh, political ideology, social dominance, and also prejudice in relation to racial and ethnic minority groups, once again, we're seeing these empathy and indifference items um, uniquely predicting additional variants beyond what could be accounted for at that first step. Now looking at attitudes toward affirmative action, we see lots of things lighting up in terms of adding to the prediction, including many participant variables. But yet again, we see political ideology, social dominance, and the feeling thermometer, as well as perceived threat, all accounting for some of our white respondents' attitudes towards affirmative action. And yet again, at the second step of analysis, we also see that empathy and indifference are also uniquely predicting uh, affirmative action or respondents' attitudes towards affirmative action, even above what can be accounted for by threat, social dominance, racial attitudes, and their own characteristics. So this is just like a little summary um, where you can see that empathy and indifference across both of these analyses, fair treatment and affirmative action, are consistently both uniquely predicting these um, policy attitudes, as is political ideology, social dominance, and the feeling thermometer. Age to some degree is consistent, but somewhat stronger or weaker effects across 
those two indicators. And then some of our indicators like threat, gender, and level of education are only significantly predicting affirmative action attitudes and not attitudes about fair treatment. Um, so in our third study, we wanted to see again if we could replicate and extend this research, replicating it once again by um, looking at um, empathy and indifference as potential predictors for policy attitudes, but this time in the context of immigration attitudes. And also we wanted to see whether this is really a pattern of effects that pertains to white Americans or whether it might apply to other respondent groups such as black Americans. Um, and in part why we wanted to focus on this comparison between white and black American respondents in relation to immigration policy attitudes is because on average, uh, prior research shows that black people tend to report more empathy and more inclusive attitudes towards immigrants as compared to white respondents. And just on average, so, uh, one example of a research study suggests that white people tend to report greater racial apathy or greater, greater racial indifference as, com as compared to people who are not white. Um, so we have approximately 500 uh, responses from white Americans and 500 responses from black Americans, all US born uh, citizens that were contacted through random digit dial telephone surveys in the Atlanta and Philadelphia metro areas. These areas were chosen because they are, uh, there's like a critical mass of both white and black populations in each city. And in each city, they've seen a very rapid growth in the um, immigrant population from Mexico. Similar to the previous study, we included single item indicators of empathy and indifference, which we adapted to refer to immigrants from Mexico as compared to reference to racial and ethnic minorities. And here again, we have indicators of threat and contact. And we also indicate, included an indicator of neighborhood exposure, how numerous or well represented are immigrants from Mexico in the neighborhoods where our respondents lived. Um, since a lot of the sociology research would also suggest that mere exposure to other groups, particularly in the absence of contact with them, can in and of itself be threat provoking and lead to more um, negative attitudes towards policies to support those groups from whom one perceives a threat. Um, just to briefly share with you our participant characteristics, again, very mixed in terms of gender identification, wide range in terms of age, in terms of political ideology, level of education. Um, but you can see on average, our US born black respondents tended to lean more liberal as compared to our white respondents. And on average, our white respondents tended to report higher levels of education compared to our black respondents. Uh, so again, these are the single items that we use in the previous study to represent empathy and indifference in the present study. And here we can see that on average, consistent with prior work, Black Americans tend to report greater empathy toward immigrants compared to that reported by white Americans, while there was no significant difference in the degree of indifference that they reported in relation to immigration or immigrants. Um, in terms of our measure of immigration policy support, uh, we had this uh, basic item where higher scores corresponded to more inclusive or supportive attitudes in terms of how to treat immigrants in the United States. Here we also found uh, consistent with prior work, black Americans tended to be more supportive or inclusive um, in terms of their immigration policy attitudes as compared to white Americans. Then when we enter these respondent characteristics and our kind of group based predictors all um, as possible predictors for immigration policy support at, oops, at the first step of the analysis, consistent with what we saw in the previous studies, uh, political ideology was a significant predictor. Here, higher scores mean more liberal uh, political ideology, so more liberal political ideology tended to be associated with greater uh, immigration policy support or more supportive policy support in the context of immigration among our white sample perceived threat, again, uh, predicting more negative uh, attitudes towards supportive immigration policy, whereas contact is associated with more support for supportive immigration policies, cons consistent with what we saw previously. And yet again, empathy and indifference for this white sample um, are uniquely and independently predicting variants in uh, support for inclusive immigration policy. 
but we see a really different pattern among our black sample. Here, it's only perceived that the more black respondents felt threatened by the presence of Mexican immigrants, the less they supported an inclusive immigration policy. Uh, political ideology wasn't playing a role, contact wasn't playing a role, empathy and indifference weren't playing a role. So just to briefly pull these together, what we're seeing across these three studies is that empathy and indifference appear to be playing somewhat distinct roles in predicting variance um, in respondents' group-based policy attitudes. And this is the case across three distinct samples of respondents and across looking at policy attitudes in the race-based and immigration-based policy context. And what we find particularly striking is that we see this pattern emerge even when we take into account a whole host of other group-based predictors of policy attitudes, such as measures of prejudice uh, across all three studies, external motivations to control prejudice or concerns about appearing prejudice, perceived economic or political threats, threats that might be measured by neighborhood exposure or the representation of immigrants in one's neighborhood in study three, social dominance orientation, political ideology, and contact experiences with the target outgroup. Um, at the same time, we also think it's really important to highlight that this trend to see empathy and indifference only predicting these policy attitudes among white Americans is really important for us to notice that it's not generalizing to any other group of respondents such as black Americans. And so this, from our perspective, really lends support for the concept of racial apathy or racial indifference that was proposed by Foreman and has been developed further by Brown as a lack of concern for societal inequality that is particularly likely to be the case among those who are most privileged or hold more powerful positions in a particular society. Um, and so in terms of future implications for future work and intervention, we think that it's important to not only expand empathy as we're talking about in this uh, talk series, but also to think about how we can curb apathy toward outgroup members and outgroup members' experiences, particularly among those who occupy the most privileged positions in society, such that we are starting to think about indifference as really being kind of a luxury of privilege. And I was thinking about this as being very consistent with what Emma was describing around Charles Mill's concept of white ignorance, right? That we have the privilege of being able to ignore the, the suffering or challenges that other groups face. So I will stop there and uh, save time for us to talk about other questions. Thank you. Well, that was great. Thank you, Linda. Um, we do have one comment by Maria in the side chat here um, about how the experience as a DEI specialist having encountered empathetic whites who do not acknowledge or consider the need to have underprivileged group participation and policy creation making the latter recipients without a voice. Um. Yeah, if I could just briefly respond to that, I think that's a, a huge point and something that, especially those of us who occupy higher status or higher power positions, part of the white community in the US, when we see ourselves as allies or well-intentioned, we, you know, we often overestimate our ability to predict what people of color would want to have represented. <laughs> and so I think one, like a couple things that we can do is um, advocate to have greater participation in policy decision making among a more diverse set of people, like having a more diverse set around the table or in the room as those decisions are being made. And also to talk about the importance of that um, and the importance of caring about societal inequality or racial justice issues with um, other white people. And that's something that um, sometimes, you know, we grew up often feeling that we're not supposed to talk about race, maybe we don't feel knowledgeable enough to talk about race, or that we have enough expertise. Um, but I think in some ways, it's, it's actually important for us to say, yeah, even if I'm not perfect, I still want to talk about it, because it's something worth talking about, something important to talk about, uh, to kind of raise our collective consciousness that it is our problem, <laughs> not just other people's problem to deal with. 
So it's really interesting data. I mean, across the three studies, and you know, if others have questions, please do drop them in the Q and A or the chat. Um, we have plenty of time. Uh, so I think, um, I mean, empathy and indifference is different psychological constructs. I think is really interesting. And in the beginning, you talked about indifference from the perspective of the moral circle or moralization more broadly. Um, it just made me think of various like connecting frameworks. I'm, I'm wondering if I'm thinking of like Jenna Bowman's work on prescriptive and proscriptive morality, for example, like, you know, it might, might, might one code empathy as, you know, something that is being perceived as something discretionary that would be great to cultivate if possible, whereas indifference, the, the wording of the indifference items it makes me wonder if they're being, you know, I am, am I, not responsible for this? Am I not obligated? And I'm wondering if something about the wording might be bringing to mind more like what is what is morally required rather than optional. That would be great if you can do it. Yeah, I, I love that comment. And I, I look so sad that my pen just ran out of ink because I want to be able to write that down. <laughs> um, so I may ask you to like type me a little note to remind me about that. Um, and that very much fits with, I think, where our ideas for this came from. You know, a lot of our research on this really grew after the 2016 presidential election in the US where um, I, I can speak for myself, what I saw in the world around me was a lot of white people treating racial justice issues as kind of like a hobby that some people have and that others don't, which would very much fit with this, like, is it required or is it optional frame? Um, so, you know, people are like, oh, that's like, that's great that like focusing on that is what you do with your free time. I, you know, I go to yoga or I do other things with my free time, um, that it's not an obligation that we all have as citizens or as, as part of a social fabric, um, to, to contend with. And so that's really what compelled me to want to pursue this line of research. And I think that's also part of what has led us to start thinking about linking, um, are thinking about empathy and indifference to circles of moral inclusion or exclusion. Like are certain groups or communities just not even on the radar in, in our thinking about moral concern, that they just don't hit our map of things that we should be or need to be thinking about or talking about. So I, I really appreciate your grace in that point um, as I hope to somehow integrate that into my own thinking. On that note, there is a question by one of the anonymous attendee who says, great talk, thank you. And how do you think interventions to expand empathy might help or not help to curb apathy? Oh, such an interesting question. I think oftentimes, um, at least in the research literature, uh, one way, one common approach that has been used to try to in induce empathy or enhance empathy is trying to encourage people to take, you know, imagine taking the perspective of the other person, try to be in their shoes, try to imagine how they're feeling about the predicament that they're in. And I can imagine that for people, perhaps, you know, based on the data that I've just showed, <laughs> people on the on a more center or right end of the political ideology continuum, there might be a couple of pitfalls with that approach. On the one hand, they might say, well, why should I care, <laughs> right? Like, it's like, I mean, I can try, but they might not really try deeply, right? So there might be a difference. I'm thinking of your work, Daryl, in terms of like motivated empathy, right? Like people may have varying degrees of motivation to really engage with that scenario that might affect the degree to which that scenario or that induction of empathy is effective. So that's one issue. But then the other one it comes to mind is some work that you know, focuses more on like the ironic effects of empathy uh, from like a, a generation past in the empathy literature by like say Nick Epley and other colleagues that would say, well, when we think we're trying to imagine how other people feel, we're actually kind of projecting how we would feel or what we would do in that situation. And given that, we are members of different groups who have different sets of lived experiences. You know, I can see, for example, I can fortunately see very easily the example of a well-meaning white person trying to imagine themselves being stopped 
by a police officer and imagining themselves in, as a black person in that space and say, well, why don't I just say, sir, and, you know, be, you know, keep my hands on the wheel and just do all the polite things that, you know, we're supposed to do when, when law enforcement stops us without having the experience necessarily of having been stopped a gazillion times before, kind of this death by a thousand cuts <laughs> experience that microaggressions often lead to extreme levels of hostility where people who are members of disadvantaged groups have to check their anger, um, do other forms of monitoring or regulating their emotions that on average white people don't need to do to the same degree. Also, there's research suggesting from body cam footage and like a coding of what's been said by police officers in police stops of white drivers compared to black drivers, that less respectful language is used on average by police officers in relation to black drivers compared to white drivers. So whereas a white experience might be, you know, would you please step out of the car, ma'am or sir? Um, more respectful language is not like those terms of sir or ma'am denoting a sense of respect aren't as often used um, for black drivers, right? So we might be able to do our best to try to relate to the experiences or take the position or stand in the shoes of people who have different lived experiences than we do, but we might not always be accurate and we might underestimate the degree to which we're not accurate. So at least that's how I would tend to think about it. Sorry, that was a rambly response, but. Hopefully it made some sense. It is really interesting to think about, you know, from a motivated empathy perspective, you know, thinking about ways to boost empathy, but also accurate empathy that's tracking with all the perspectives that are relevant to the situation seems really useful. Uh, I have Maria on the side chat here is uh, some follow-up points, sort of bridging some of her earlier comments with the response to that question, just noting. Um, just various considerations and training uh, people to engage empathetically. But uh, Emma, did you want to follow? Yeah, I think started going in a, in a new direction. Um, well, you're somewhat similar. So I wanted to, because I think early on in your talk, you said Linda that you were kind of expecting the empathy and the indifference to like really correlate. And then it looked like at times, it was a sort of inverse relationship, but then like maybe I'm not seeing the data properly or like to the same degree that you are. Um, so I wanted to hear about that, but then also like if indifference isn't the opposite of empathy, if caring and not caring are not opposites, like we might think they are, like what is the opposite of empathy? Like, have you, like what do you think, what, do, what should we be looking for? Is it like hatred or something? Is it like caring a lot about their ill life or like their bad <laughs> experiences? So yeah, I'd love to hear what you'd say about that. I, mean, I think I think that's a great question. I don't know that we've nailed down exactly um, what you know the exact opposite is. Um, I mean, I am finding myself thinking about words. I think it was Elie Wiesel who talks about you know the opposite of hate isn't love, it's indifference. You know that it's not. So I, I think what we what we actually probably need to do more of, and I, I suspect Daryl is much better read <laughs> in this than I am. Um, is thinking about how like caring or lack of caring, so kind of in the positive direction or the negative direction might take more active or passive forms. And I think at least in the prior research literature, we've tended to think about things like empathy on the one hand, which is kind of like positive active or threat, which is positive negative. You know, like I feel threatened by them, therefore negative attitudes. I feel like I care, therefore I'm going to do something or I'm motivated in a direction. And I think what we're seeing with indifference is it's like, it's kind of negatively tinged, but it's kind of passive. It's not worthy of my attention or energy. And I think, you know, so, so I don't know if I would frame it as like, what is the opposite? But I would almost think about like a quadrant with two axes. And then to think about, okay, so then like on the positive side, instead of like a more active form of empathy, it might be like tolerance, right? It might be generally positive, but very passive. Not really, you know, that armchair kind of like, oh, sure, I have no problem, you know, but not really being active. And so I wonder if thinking about 
those two axes, or at least this is how my brain is thinking about it, <laughs> um, or my mind really, but um, thinking about in terms of those two axes might help us chart, like, so then who, who would be the people to take action? Who would be the people to be willing to listen, but maybe not take action? Who would be the people who would, you know, not be willing to listen? <laughs> like, or, you know, and, and so where do we intervene? And for whom? Are we trying to get people to protest in the streets? Well, if we're dealing with people who are just indifferent, maybe trying to get them to think about why they should care is actually a better point of intervention. Um, so yeah, I, that's, it's all kind of loose, but I, this is just kind of where thoughts are taking me. I'd love to hear your thoughts, um, Emma, as well. You know, thinking about tolerance in here, like that's really cool. <laughs> um, and especially, yeah, like describing that as passive, but positive. I like, you know, just every time Martin Luther King Day rolls around and you hear about like that, like white moderate, and, like you're the real problem. It's, yeah, like this is a real problem. Um, but I hadn't thought of it as a failure of empathy. And, and I wonder if even you would capture it like in this sort of policy question, because they could be, if they're tolerant, they'd be like, yeah, great. Yeah, let's um, have that policy. But then would they do anything? Is that then your follow up there? <laughs> Um, yeah, you want to like I, separate that out somehow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is some research on what's called the principal implementation gap, which is this idea that like everyone reports racial equality in the abstract, but they don't necessarily support it in more concrete, where we actually talk about programs like, okay, so now let's do something about it. In that case, people are like, well, I mean, I like the idea, but not the way it's done there. Or you can think about you know, protesting for, for racial justice, like what Colin Kaepernick has gone through. It's like, well, you should protest, but just not that way, mm -hmm. right? That when things become concrete, it's kind of where the rubber hits the road and it's really doing something, endorsing something that may rub up against your other motivations or other competing motivations in more concrete ways. Like who lives in your neighborhood? How you're gonna spend your time and energy? How you're going to spend your resources and your that's <laughs> exactly exactly and so i think for me that's also why you know i think about it in these active versus passive ways because some of my policy oriented work focuses on um racial integration and equity in u.s public schools mm -hmm. and you definitely see like yes i totally support you know all kids should be educated they're all our children at a kind of rhetorical level but then oftentimes you get, well, I don't want those kids in my school district because that'll hurt my kids' education. And I feel for parents that they're actually put in that situation, right? Like I would much rather property taxes not being tied to how we fund schools. <laughs> so that it's not parents who have to make this decision. Where do I live? Do I have to choose between living in an integrated community and having good schools? Like why not just change the structure so they don't have to deal with that competing motivation issue? And so that racial equity is not at odds. It doesn't create a zero sum frame for white families to, to deal with. Um, so again, very rambly response, but I really see all these things as so connected. I just don't know how to do research on all of them in such a multidisciplinary way yet. So if anyone here has thoughts, contact me, let me know. You know, it's interesting, like the, 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 the quadrant, like the feeling of a two by two, like um, active, passive, and consider like being high and low on empathy and or indifference, just all what those different combinations might look like. Um, you know, it reminds me like some like older work by I think Hoff, like Hoffman and developmental psychology, like moral, moral principles is the stabilizer on empathy. So if there's a concern that in all, if I allies or bystanders, if there's a worry that empathy is a motivator of policy support consistently might be problematic if it's seen as discretionary by some allies or it's, or it's seen as exhausting or fatiguing or something. If you add the principal component, I mean, Hoffman wrote about how it can sort of act as a sort of stabilizer. If you attach it to a principle, if you see, if you have like the opposite of indifference and empathy, might that be more a more sustainable motivator? Um, it's, it's interesting to consider like ways we could try to manipulate the indifference factor to see if it would sort of stabilize the empathy connection or help it paralyze or something. 
if, if I could also just add, so some, so we've tried a couple of times trying to just like experimentally manipulate empathy and indifference separately. And where we often find a challenge is that oftentimes the control, <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Oftentimes the control condition in empathy studies is try to be as objective as possible. You know, adopt a neutral stance so that you're not invested. And so we have, you know, we've tried testing like an objective objectivity condition and an indifference condition as a contrast to an empathy condition. And empathy is clearly contrasted to the other two, but distinguishing between the objective and indifferent conditions is, is really challenging. In, from like a positivist, you know, like novel contribution to the literature perspective. But then there's a part of me that also wants to address like this issue of objectivity. Like when people say like, you know, like politics is pol like, you know, or like policy decisions or uh, decisions by the Supreme Court, <laughs> you know, should be objective. They shouldn't be political. It's like, well, but what information we choose to pay attention to is relevant. You know, whose perspective we take in thinking about the implications of different issues is relevant. And I think where we often get stuck, or at least where I've gotten stuck in reading like court opinions, I'm thinking here about race conscious school assignment cases where, you know, cases that have gone to the Supreme Court, like parents involved, or Fisher v. Texas about the use of race as a criterion for admission to public universities. Um, what I find is the more conservative justices often use a more, what I would call, apologies, Emma, a more philosophical stance where it's kind of like how our society should be saying, well, if racial classification is the problem, then why should racial classification be the answer, right? And it's in this kind of esoteric abstract idea of like, this is not how things should be decided. And then you have people on the liberal side who are a little more like de facto, it's like, but people are treated differently on the basis of race. And so I think there is something about level of abstraction. So I've been thinking about construal level theory as well. Um, so I don't know, Daryl, maybe you and I will need to write a review paper on this stuff, <laughs> like trying to pull these threads together because I think it's not only the quadrant of kind of positive, negative, af um, active, passive, but also something related to psychological distance. How closely are you affected versus how much can you have the privilege of being a distant observer and philosophizing about this issue. Yeah, there, you know, it's interesting. Um, one of, so one of my collaborators who, I know he's, he's in the, he's in the chat here, uh, Jose uh, Soto here at Penn State. We have a grant with um, some folks in the Edna Bennett Pierce Prevention Research Center. Uh, and we're looking at um, empathy in the context of social disparities. And we've also, in, in thinking about the designs for some of our work, we face this very question, like, if you, if you give people the option of empathizing or being objectively distanced from different sorts of disparities um, in our work, we, what does it mean to take like a distance perspective? Like, what does that imply psychologically, ethically, normatively? Like, so it's sort of, it's something we've, we don't, we're not sure we have an answer, um, but we just, we've thought about this question too. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. I can hear you. Because uh, yeah, like Siren bringing up the legal perspective, and especially that conservative legal perspective that's so abstracted. Because I, I do some work with critical race theory and like the law, um, and like the whole point is that this objective standard, this like reasonable person standard, depending on get into this too, um, is so steeped in bias. Like it's just this was like this is part of our empathy for the white guy perspective, um, and even to see that like like. Uh, as the philosophical perspective. I think that's how they see themselves. They're like, I am the rational observer and I can abstract away in a way that other people can't because they're so wrapped up in their identities. And it's like, that is so wrong. You're not doing that. Right. Um, and, and even who gets to be like righteously angry or who gets to say, oh, I'm just being reasonable. And it's like, no, you're yelling right now. Like You are like furious with me, but you think you're being reasonable. Um, so maybe I wonder also too if like maybe the self empathy for like understanding yourself is like getting angry and like being invested and caring too much about your own perspective and not understanding other people's perspective that maybe even like the perpetrators um, of these harms need to do some more uncovering of like actually I care a lot <laughs> um, I'm just caring about a different group. 
Yeah, there's also, I mean, I'm also thinking about research that has shown an, an intergroup empathy gap in our field, basically that we just have more empathy for in-group members and out-group members, right? That's, that's our default setting in a lot of ways. Um, and so when, so what may be is that we're on some psychological level equating objectivity with just like our baseline. Um, and if we remember the dominant group, then, you know, our baseline is not including the perspective of those who are disadvantaged within that system. It is really problematic when you're trying to address equity and disparities as, as Gerald was describing his work. And that's super interesting when, I mean, when you think about like some of the arguments against empathy, which sort of assume that like, you know, that they'll notice a parochial, like an empathy gap in these intergroup contexts of various kinds and suggest that, well, that just is how empathy is. But from both of your talks, I'm getting the perspective. It might, that might be how it is as a result of other things that are happening in the background you know, choices to be indifferent or to use certain language or prioritize certain perspectives or angles and situations. That is, that is an interesting way to think about, you know, arguments for the, the typicality of like intergroup empathy gaps. That's really interesting. I think for me, that's, a, it's very much related to why I study contact between groups <laughs> because, and, and why I'm so concerned about lack of social integration. Um, because the more we sort, whether it's on the basis of race, partisanship, socioeconomic status, whatever it happens to be, the less insight we will gain into how other constituencies within our very diverse social fabric live and experience the world. And you know, some of the earlier work I and others have done on meta perceptions also shows that, you know, we um, we assume to share similar views with people who are like us, but we assume difference and conflict with people who are different from us as compared to normalizing difference and feeling more familiar with difference, not have it be so threatening. I think that's what I would love personally for our society to be like, that we can encounter difference and not automatically get defensive or reactive or pretend that we are being objective um, in the face of it. Um, to really understand, like we're all motivated beings, and um, and to just be more open to different perspectives. And I think this also relates to something you were raising, Emma. That you know, there, there this idea of self compassion. There's there's growing research in social psychology showing that um, if you can affirm people's worth, either as individuals or as group members, as members of a privileged group, like being white people, they are less likely to express prejudice towards other groups. They are more willing to acknowledge responsibility for harm doing done to other groups. Um, that it's kind of the psychological need to be like, no, but I'm good, I'm right, I'm, I'm just, I'm moral. And that if we can reassure people, you are, you're great. You've got lots going for you. And it's like a both and, right? And <laughs> there might be some room for growth too or a way of reconfiguring things as well, um, that people, when they feel affirmed, um, are more open to entertaining that. And what I find challenging, and you know, sometimes when I facilitate racial bias workshops or discussions about race, or things like this, um, is it's like, well, aren't you just playing then to white fragility? Aren't you just catering to white people's needs? And my view on that is kind of like yes and no. On the one hand, I would say yes, in service of having them try to be more open to listening to perspectives that might differ from their default. Um, so it's kind of a strategic, like strategically trying to address the psychological needs and motivations that people have in order to try to create a psychological space where they're willing to be more open and responsive to things that are different from what they take for granted or what reflects their experience. I would love to hear anyone's thoughts about any of this stuff. I have this worry with white fragility too, of like, yeah, like what's effective versus like what's right um, or what's fair, but especially like, I don't know, this reminds me so much of tone policing conversations of being like, oh, if you would just say it in a way that I could listen like straight out of Audrey Lord or something, um, then I would listen to you. And it's like, that doesn't seem to be true. Like, it just seems like people find more and more to be defensive about. 
uh, and that. So like some in some of my other work, I wonder about uh, changing a different part of it, so a different intervention, rather than like, how can I say this so you can hear me? Um, changing how we think about what it means to be good. Um, and goodness isn't never making a mistake. It's never saying something wrong. It's never saying something harmful. Goodness is trying to do better. Um, and this like forward looking perspective and thinking about oneself is like, yeah, I said a racist thing sometimes. Most people do. We were raised in this terrible society. Of course you said a racist thing sometimes. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> um, and, and, and seeing even like this request, like somebody calling out at microaggression or something else or like saying like, oh, you're not thinking about my perspective when you're making these policy decisions, whatever it is. I, in a way that's like a really, like it already is an affirmation of like, I wanna keep talking to you. If I, if I didn't wanna keep talking to you, I wouldn't bother calling it out. I would just leave. I would just go do something else. I would go talk to my friends. But I, I think you can do better. And like, I think if we can start hearing that or like get white people to hear it that way instead of hearing it as an attack, like that might be an intervention worth looking into. <laughs> but I don't know how to do it. I think there's a question for Emma from Maria. Have Canadian multicultural policies impacted social empathy? If so, how? Uh, so first of all, I'm from the US. <laughs> so I'm at a Canadian institution, but I'm not sure. Like I've been here for seven years, um, but I'm not sure how well I can speak to this uh, in terms of like the day-to-day -day life. Um, so yeah, like there is a different conversation about race in Canada instead of the like melting pot sort of metaphor, they use the mosaic metaphor of thinking about like side by side, the different pieces that these different cultures can bring. Um, I'm not sure when it comes down to it, how much difference that makes. Uh, I'd, yeah, I'd like to see studies on that. I haven't looked into it um, in the way that you might wish. I, but it does, like one thing I have noticed coming here is that there's a reluctance to talk about race. Like there's this sort of like politeness norm almost. Um, and then like, it's familiar from childhood too. Like it's not something I never come across, but I like, even at the, like even people you might expect to want to talk about race, like people involved in uh, work within academia, like they just don't want to get into it. They worry that it might like cause trouble um, or that it, yeah, it might, require changes. And there's also this very sense of, oh, Canada, like compared to the US, Canada is so much better. Um, and maybe that's true, but it's also, yeah, okay, but it's not perfect. It's not this utopia in the North, um, especially when thinking about something like uh, indigenous communities in Canada, which of course the US has that problem too, um, but yeah, they haven't solved multicultural problems. Um, yeah, so that was kind of friendly too, but uh, I get, like I feel like these conversations are different, but they actually have more in common than you might expect. But Martina, you spent time in Canada. Like, how do you feel about that? I was I was thinking about that while you were talking. I was like, how do I? Because my experience in, in Canada is being as an immigrant, uh, so I was trying to think about the little things that I've noticed and uh, about immigration. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think, I think this idea that sort of Canada in comparison, it's better than the U.S. has sort of created this, this problem where Canadians are not necessarily alert to the problems that there are in Canada. And if they are, they're like smaller than the problems that are in the U.S. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, as an immigrant, I've... <sighs> There's been some some differences that I that I've noted that, that I've noticed, a, which I've attributed personally to a multicultural approach. Where, in a melting pot, it's it wouldn't be necessarily the case, but in a multicultural approach, there's more. There's the aim of making an adjustment, uh, depending on you know different backgrounds. Um, I just remember trying to take my exam for my driving license, uh, which I could have taken in Italian if I wanted to, because I'm an Italian citizen. Um, so I've noticed that sort of taking a step to sort of, you know, um, and then I remember, and this is really something, something personal that I've noticed when sort of applying for, uh, for permanent residency, for my visas, the, the office that does that, it's IRCC, which is Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada. So citizens of 
renewing their passport and um, immigrants like me renewing my visa, we are in the same place. That wouldn't be necessarily the case in the US. There's a sort of more separation. And that, that language, that putting together citizens and immigrants, to me, made me feel like there's a difference in this. This seems like an abstract conceptualization, but it actually has an impact in how you feel in, in the way I felt like I belonged. So that has been my own very personal experience and something that I noticed quite in the, in the past few years. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. And, um, and for those, uh, Linda just dropped a, a citation here on the side here about group affirmation and acknowledgement of responsibility for reparation among Canadians. Yeah, so I guess one, you know, one question that your findings made me think of, Linda, was, um, but it also sort of dovetails with some of these points that have come up and then the point about, your point, Emma, about where we're turning our attention. So I feel like I've sometimes seen with arguments about empathy, like, you know, maybe empathy isn't the answer in terms of like, what is the best motivator or, or it has severe drawbacks or serious drawbacks as a motivator. Um, but you're finding indifference is this different psychological construct as a predictor. And I'm wondering if, you know, I've seen various philosophers and psychologists argue for like the power of compassion or outrage or other motivators that might be, you know, as important. If, if you if you if you if you pair those with the initial step of not being indifferent, um, I guess where do you see? And might it be that it's not indifference with empathy, with empathy that works the best, perhaps indifference or the lack of indifference plus empathy, but like the lack of indifference plus other potential motivators of study? I guess I, I kind of think about this as it's almost like when we're teaching students and we're trying to get a sense of like, where are they at right now? <laughs> and where do we want them to go? I mean, in, in some sense, it's like whether we're teaching students or trying to do like political persuasion. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really just like, you know, vaudeville <laughs> in the Catskills, like understanding your audience. Like, I think there's a lot of that that underlies all of this. Um, because I also think about, you know, the, some of the processes that have been identified in the contact research literature which shows that part of why contact between groups is effective in reducing prejudice and promoting you know, more positive attitudes towards policies that benefit other groups is because it helps to reduce our feelings of anxiety and threat and helps to build our capacity for empathy. And there's at least one study of which I'm aware and Tom Pettigrew and I have also just theorized about this that maybe there's actually a sequential process that is operating, that first we kind of need to reduce the feelings of anxiety and threat to enhance the capacity for people to be willing to take others' perspectives or empathize with their concerns or express compassion. And, you know, when I talk about this in workshops or with students, I often will say, you know, like imagine, you know, trying to take the perspective of another person who you feel is a threat to you. Like that's a tall order. That's a a hard ask. And so I, I really do think about it in terms of, well, what, what are like, what are the raw materials that we're dealing with? We're, we're in a space where white Americans are either living in segregated communities and or more often than not exposed to media framing relations between them and other racial and ethnic groups in our country as zero sum, where what's better for them is worse for us. We're losing, we're on the losing end, we're losing power. And that's inherently threatening. So, you know, at the same time as we might try to use these interventions, you know, at a more localized level, I think what we really need to do are change the structural conditions that frame relations between groups in either or terms or as zero sum frames. And actually this is kind of related in my mind, at least to other work that Eric Knowles and I have done. I don't know if you saw our paper on minority collusion. Um, this idea that a lot of white people have that all these racial and ethnic minority groups are colluding against us to like to take white people down. 
Um, because that that's the frame that I think a lot of white people are living in, the, the social, political, media environment. And, you know, and I think, you know, also having, you know, people really worse off economically, this in huge income and wealth gap that we have in this country, all of those things are like natural contributors <laughs> to perceiving threat. And I think that in and of itself could easily make people indifferent or enhance that leaning toward the intergroup empathy gap. Like, well, I have to look out for my people, you know, cause there's all these other groups out there that are gonna threaten our well being or our ability to survive. And so why should I empathize with them? Why should I care? Cause I've got enough of my own problems. Um, so that's, I think that's some of the big stuff that we're really confronted with if we want empathy to be successful in the long term, right? To have long-term change where people maintain a certain degree of caring or empathic concern for other groups and not just when induced to do so in a research study. And I think that's something that, um, and also to weave in Jose's comment here um, from the chat. I mean, as much as we can induce empathy, you know, introduce it experimentally, you know, I think our group has been really interested in you know, well, when do people opt into empathy in everyday settings and naturalistically in everyday situations? If you, you know, choose what perspectives you want to pay attention to, um, and yeah, how do we calibrate those choices and yeah, shift away from zero sum thinking to other structural supports for that? Um, Jose's point, he, he says it's interesting to think about this attitude towards engaging discussions about race and disparities. And many DEI scholars, professionals talk about the value of dialogue. And part of the motivation in the work that uh, he and I are doing, uh, empathy for outgroups groups in the context of disparities, is that avoidance of empathy in these contexts may shut down possible conversations and dialogue. And so he was wondering if you have any thoughts on, if either of you have any thoughts on this. Emma, do you, have, you look like you're in deep thought, so I wasn't sure if you had something to share just yet. Yeah, you can go first, I'll keep thinking. Okay. Um, so like some of the other work that I'm doing kind of related to my racial justice and equity and education side is um, surveys of teachers that we've done trying to understand what predicts their willingness to engage in race talk with their students to like talk about race, talk about racism and what inhibits their willingness to do so. Um, and we haven't actually focused quite so much on empathy there. Um, we've tended to focus more on a sense of efficacy or lack of efficacy. I think because, because we're kind of told, or at least we've been socialized as white people to think in colorblind ways, and unless we're in more diverse environments, to think in more colorblind ways, to think that talking about race is taboo. Here I'm also thinking, we'll say about like Evan Applebaum and Sam Summers research um, you know, like white people just don't want to mention race, right? That's kind of where, where, where we start from, unless we know it's okay, or there's a safe space where we're encouraged to like structured dialogues or things like that. Um, I think there's just a lot of uncertainty that white teachers and the research that we're doing that white teachers experience about, well, if I bring it up, will the school district have my back, given what we see discussions of you know, critical race theory, theory that I'm sure Emma is very familiar with, you know, increasingly districts don't have teachers back if they want to engage students around these topics. Also concerns about what their, what parents would think, you know, like if I bring up one of these topics, um, like Ferguson, George Floyd in school, and a parent asks a kid, so what did you talk about in school today? You know, then they might get angry calls from parents at the school district saying, why are you trying to teach my kids to be racist? Or why are you trying to find out if my kid's racist? Like, you know, that game of telephone that often happens as a result of kind of the different ways in which we interpret information. So I think avoidance is motivated <laughs> um, out of fear, out of lack of normative support, out of feeling less than skilled or unfamiliar with how to navigate these types of conversations. Um, and in that sense, for me, it relates very much to a lot of the other work in the contact literature around intergroup anxiety and just feeling uncertain and 
um, I would be happy to send you some other papers related to my thinking on those topics, if you're interested. Yeah, but I do have a feeling like fear, I think that comes up in the microaggression literature, like the fear of saying the wrong thing, especially or like falling in and like committing microaggression, even if you've already done that. Um, and that's why we're talking about it. Uh, but yeah, getting people to the table um, to have these conversations in the first place. Uh, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective, but thinking about it from like getting, like getting people to be open to talking about it and not to feel like they can't or they shouldn't or they risk something if they're doing it. Like, I, I feel like it would take something like changing the norms around it, like changing, especially like what we think of as blameworthy, um, what we think of as wrong to say, uh, and what we think of as like being a good person, like a good person engages in these kind of conversations and tries and cares and attempts it. Um, if we can shift towards that model, and that we should, like a person knows the history, a good, like it's negligent not to know the history of these stereotypes. It's negligent not to recognize that like we've long associated the Asian American community with disease. And that's why the discussion around COVID-19 is so horrible. Um, and that, which is why we need to teach it in school, which is why we need to have these kind of critical conversations in school. That, yeah, it does just get kind of stultifying of like, well, if all these pieces need to change in order to even talk about changing all these pieces, like how can you do it? Um, especially going back to some of those individual questions earlier on of like how can an individual is a citizen but then I do like kind of reframing it um, of like yeah like there's like I see the need for these structural changes but also society is built out of individuals like you can so like as we change society changes it's like this cycle is loop and so in some ways it feels like I can't possibly affect that bigger picture but in other ways it's like what is that bigger picture except a whole bunch of people like me um, and which gives me more hope when I start to think about it of just like, okay, like I don't know how to get people to the table. If I don't know, I don't know what their situations are, but can I start thinking about how to get my family to the table over a period of many decades uh, trying to work with like my father's anti-abortion. Um, and we're, you know, I do worry that like he'll bring me in his direction, but like bring him a little bit in my direction. Uh, is it worth having those conversations? Is it dangerous to have those conversations? Like I do feel all of these worries. And, and this isn't again, like, this is sort of preparatory work before having conversations without group members. Like, can we be doing this within our families, within our friend circles? I think that's brought up in Linda's comments before too, but like that, yeah, just gives me more hope that it might become possible to shift the norms about even being able to have these conversations uh, sometimes. It's interesting. I mean, that's where, you know, focusing on empathy gaps is like the ultimate out, like, like negative outcome that we often observe all this preparatory work, I think like a motivational standpoint is super interesting because if all these things are factoring into people's decisions about whether to even enter into situations that have the conditions for the possibility of empathy of unfolding, like going to that level is I think really important. I mean, Maria notes in the side chat here that, you know, avoidance might be promoted or punished in different structures. Um, you know, some of the points about indifference and not even just indifference, but sometimes, you know, negative moralization of empathy so like if you think of like partisan polarization context, for example. Um, yeah, there's a lot of definitely would love to keep talking about this as possible future collaborations. And there's a lot of interesting possibilities here. Uh, there's a question from Emily that I wanted to touch on, uh, which is directed at, at both Emma and Linda. How do your understandings of trauma, racial trauma, generational trauma inform your work with care and empathy? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because actually, because like I've been working on microaggressions, um, but then next I want to work on more macroaggressions like trauma um, and particularly, yeah, thinking about how given a past history of microaggressions, we might be shaped not even to notice trauma, um, especially with something like race where you're just not supposed to talk about it, you're not supposed to care, you're not supposed to be like one of those people who brings it up all the time. Um, and generational trauma is another great issue to start thinking about that like, yeah, I don't, like growing up, we didn't even have the name for generational trauma um, and then and we need it. <laughs> I, and, and I think actually this conversation is maybe a little bit better in Canada because of the discussion surrounding residential schools and truth and reconciliation within Canada about really thinking through how um, the experience with residential schools of the older generation is still shaping the experience of indigenous youth today 
um, whether it's through their parents or just through an awareness of what their parents went through. And you see the same sort of thing with like families with Holocaust survivors um, of working through. Yeah, so I think self-empathy becomes really, really interesting here um, and hard and worth doing because otherwise you do just keep perpetuating these cycles um, of like you never saw how to handle your own emotions so you don't teach your children how to do it and they don't teach their children um, or you never saw how to have good relationships with people so you end up back in these misogynistic terrible relationships and abusive relationships um because that's all you've ever known and again thinking a lot about what schools can do to intervene in that like if it can't come from a family because they haven't had the resources to understand what's going on or they haven't had the time to process these emotions or the support to go through help processing these emotions what can be taught in school understanding experiences of trauma that might just not have been named, might not have been given a language for. Uh, yeah, I think this is a great thing to pursue. <laughs> yeah, if I could um, just add uh, briefly to respond to Emily's question. So I guess I have a couple of different things that come to mind immediately. And one is more linked to your description of racial trauma. Um, and that's where I find myself thinking about the the really important, crucial role that white people should play, really have to play as an imperative as compared to being optional and talking with other white people about racism in part to kind of carry some of the burden so that if not always people of color put in the place of having to like educate white people, divulge their lived experiences and have them be cross-examined. <laughs> you know, like I think that's, that's one of the things that um, makes me think about doing this work as an imperative. Um, and we actually, you know, we not too long ago conducted a study with Brooke Burroughs, a graduate student at UMass, who's the lead of this project where we surveyed white, like self-described white allies um, and asked them about their willingness to kind of like talk about racial justice issues with a variety of different interactants or conversation partners, um, either, uh, white people who are also allies or in like interracial dialogue spaces, um, white people who do not, don't identify as allies or are not in those spaces, people of color who um, are in like interracial dialogue spaces or clearly supportive of racial justice issues and people of color who are not explicitly supportive of, of racial justice issues. And what we basically find is that white, our white ally respondents were reported most anxiety and least interest and comfort in talking about white people who are not explicitly supportive of racial justice issues. And those are like precisely the people that we need to talk to. <laughs> um, and so again, I, I, I raise it here because I think it's like an example of competing motivations, right? Like in the abstract on some level, I think white people who care about racial justice know that we have to carry part of the burden. But then when, when it comes up against, rubs against some of our other motivations to be like, to, to not introduce tension into our social relationships, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we may be less active and more passive than we would like to be. Um, so that's what I think about in relation to racial trauma. And then kind of growing off of a bit of the themes that Emma was mentioning related to generational or intergenerational trauma. I do also refer to the, the Holocaust as like a starting point. I happen to be a Jewish American, if you can tell by my hair. Um, I often am assumed to be Jewish just by my features. Um, and, um, you know, in my family, thinking about this like historical suffering of. Jewish people is very closely tied to my family's history and commitment to any social justice efforts. Um, and I, I've seen this also, you know, there's a movement Jews for Darfur, like when, you know, we don't want others to experience genocide the way we've experienced genocide and examples of survivors of the Rwandan genocide and survivors of the Nazi uh, genocide Holocaust traveling around together to speak in schools um, about just the issue of genocide. Um, so I think oftentimes there can be what uh, Johanna Volhart, 
another social psychologist would call altruism born of suffering, that we can recognize our victimization in more inclusive ways as compared to in more exclusive ways where we might only you know, think of ourselves as those who have suffered and no one else has suffered like we have. I'll say off a little, a little bit, um, and sort of combining maybe the last couple of questions, just thinking about, uh, like a, just this idea popped in my head from Bell Hooks of thinking about like changing the way that we talk about feminism to be more inclusive, of, even if men, um, and to think about like patriarchy harms, everyone hate patriarchy harms men too. And you might say similar things about other forms of oppression sort of drawing out the stuff from Charles Mills that I've talked about already. I, and, and so like, this isn't trauma necessarily, although it can be like Bell Hooks has these incredible books about like black boyhood, um, about like being taught not to feel, being taught to only feel anger and how that is traumatic um, and how that gets erased if you only focus feminism on women. I, and I wonder if this might be another like sort of intervention point of maybe even first recognize how these structures have harmed you too. Like you're you're part of this, you're one of us, you're one of the people who have been harmed. It's not us versus them. It's, we should all work towards this together because it's a terrible system for everyone. Even if you're at the very top of it, you're terrified. Um, you can't handle conflict. You can't um, live your life in a way that you want to. You can't form community. You don't think community is even important. You feel so lonely, you commit suicide. Like there's, if we see these problems as shared problems from a shared source, I wonder if that might bring more people to the table um, and just being like, yeah, we're all impacted and those work, that works really differently. Um, you don't want to say that like only white guys suffering is important, like that would be going way too far the opposite direction, but recognizing that there are so many different forms of trauma and so many different ways in which one might be traumatized by these structures um, from different groups, I think, might be a good intervention point to think about. That's great. Thank you both. And uh, Linda, thanks for dropping the additional um, citation down there at the New York Times article. Um, yeah, no, this has been, uh, I'm mindful of uh, nearing the end of our discussion time here. If anybody has any last questions uh, for either of our speakers or if either of you have any last points of connection or convergence or questions for each other before we close out. This was great. Thanks to both of you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Really fun. Hope well, to continue having these conversations. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 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 it's, fun, it's interesting and fun to also see some you know across the four panels we've had see some some common themes emerge. You know, the very first panel where we talked about online outrage and, and online emotion, questions of individual and structural change um, were there as well. And yeah, it's it's been really productive these these four sets of talks. And I uh, you know thank you both for being here. Um, you know, the goal of this has been to highlight how different approaches to some of the same questions can sometimes spur exciting new conversations. And speaking from my perspective, uh, N of one, I, I think it's done so quite effectively. Um, yeah, uh, so for those of you who are interested in learning more about either of our speakers' work, there is more information on the Rock Ethics website about, um, for this panel, about their respective uh, bodies of work. Um, this is being recorded, so we'll have this up online if you entered late. We'll have this up online sometime this, this month. And all, all the other talks as well, all the other panels, we're hoping to have the archives of those up on the Rock Ethics website soon enough. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, Martina, uh, for being a wonderful co-organizer as the postdoctoral scholar in engaged ethics of the Rock. Thank you. Awesome. Um, David Price, Joe Redman, who have been helping to organize, and Ken Grau as well. Um, yeah, thanks you all for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you empathically sometime next year. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>